In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we've come to the end of Lent. Friday was the last day of Lent, and yesterday and today we prepare ourselves. Rather, the whole of Lent was a preparation, but today leads us into Holy and Great Week. The holiest week in Christianity, but a week which touches the hearts of souls of all Christians, all Orthodox Christians. And then a lot of the times, this grace which comes is not only for those who, let's say, are devout and religious, but this is felt by everyone who comes and participates in the divine services during these days. Yesterday, brothers and sisters, we celebrated the raising of Lazarus. And the raising of Lazarus, Christ did just a week before his own passion and crucifixion as to show that he too will be raised from the dead. But today we celebrate the triumphant entry of our Lord into Jerusalem. And our Lord, wanting now to go to his own, what we say, voluntary passion. In other words, he's going to give himself up for the world, for the sins of the entire humanity. He's approaching to go to the greatest thing that anyone ever did in human history, and that is to sacrifice themselves so that they can take the sins of the entire human race on his own shoulders. And he enters into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. Just after he has a meal in Bethany with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Mary and Martha were the sisters of Lazarus. And we see now these images of Mary and Martha, his sisters. And out of gratitude, Mary takes a flask of costly ointment. And this ointment was very, very expensive. It cost a lot. And she went, and as the master, as Jesus was sitting at the table and eating with them, she opened this bottle of costly ointment and she poured it on the feet of our Lord. And bowing down reverently, she took her hair and began to wipe his feet with her hair out of gratitude for Jesus, but also as a preparation. Because Jesus says that this woman is preparing me for my burial. Judas, of course, is scandalized having nothing else on his mind but, but money. And disguising it, disguising it as a form of charity. And he's scandalized and says, this ointment could have been sold for a hundred denarii, he says. He even knew the value of it. And it could have been given to the poor. But the scriptures tells us that he was scandalized because he was the one who held the money box. He was the one who took the money. And he was also a thief. And it was, as you remember, for money that this same person betrayed our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Was it that he was concerned of the poor? No. We know that he wasn't concerned for the poor. He was concerned for himself. And a lot of the times we feel exactly the same way when it comes to our faith. A lot of the times we have to ask ourselves, who are we? Are we Mary, the one who anointed the feet of Jesus? Or are we Judas? Are we Judas, the ones who are very easily scandalized? And I say this because today, brothers and sisters, we live in a society which is absolutely scandalized by the teachings of Christ and his church. There is nothing 
which fits in our daily lives when it comes to the teachings of Christ and the church. And we're scandalised. And we have a whole list of things of what the church should be like. Why isn't the church like this? Why don't they do that? Why do I have to do this? And why do I have to do that? A whole list. And I say this, brothers and sisters, because this is the week where all of this comes out. Where all of this frustration on our faith, what we say we believe and we practice, comes out. And I see this when the holy days will come, where many people will be gathered in church, but everyone for their own reasons. Thursday, Friday, Saturday will come, and you will see thousands of people, thousands of faces, which I must admit, I only see once a year, if that. And my ministry is to try to give something to all of these people, to try to give something to take away with them because I know that that's probably the only thing that they're going to have for the entire year until they come again the year after. That's why I find it amusing sometimes when some people come during these days and they come to receive Holy Communion and we give them the body and blood of Christ the servant of God and they say their name whatever it may be receives the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins and life eternal and where our response should be Amen they say thank you in other words next year again in other words we only need Christ for a year we only need Christ until now for next year because We've fulfilled our Greek traditions. We've fulfilled our duties as a Greek and as an Orthodox. And this has nothing to do with the reason why Christ came and sacrificed himself. And so we see today the image of Palm Sunday, where Jesus walks triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem. And there thousands of people, multitudes of people flock to greet Jesus in Jerusalem and he's sitting on a donkey and they began to take their outer garments off and to lay them on the road so that the donkey can walk past walk on the road where Jesus is sitting on and they shout Hosanna in the highest glory to the King of Israel the King of the Jews with celebration with joy with a triumph Little kids, little children take palm branches and, palm and leaves from olive branches and begin to wave them in the air and throw them at Jesus as a sign of triumph and victory. And then we wonder what happens five days later to all those thousands of people when Pilate asks the question, what shall I do with this man? And those thousands of people, when they were confronted with the question, what shall I do with this man, responded, not the joyous cries of Hosanna, the king of the Jews, but the angry cries of crucify him, crucify him. Do away with him. We want nothing to do with him. We have as our king who? Not Jesus. We have as our king Caesar. In other words, the Roman emperor who was at the time. And ask yourselves, brothers and sisters, who is your king? Who is your leader? Who is the one who governs your life and your soul? Is it a secular ruler? Is it this world which we have become entrapped in? Or is it our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ? who gave himself for every single one of you. Let me tell you something. Let me remind you of something. Something which is absolutely heart-wrenching when we think about. The night Jesus was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, it said that he knelt in agony. And there he said, 
My soul is deeply troubled. My soul is deeply troubled, he says, and even to the point of death. And you see Jesus suffering a great anxiety, a great even depression. And there he weeps and is very sorrowful. And at that moment, because of his stress, he begins, the scripture tells us, to sweat. And those sweat comes out, came out as drops of blood. At that moment, brothers and sisters, at that very moment, the fathers tell us that it was every single one of us, our image, this image of every single person Jesus was being confronted with, our image, my face, your face, my sins, your sins, Jesus was confronting and saying that all of those sins today I'm going to take on my own shoulders. All of those sins today I'm going to wipe away and take on themselves. Why? Because I love these people so much. I love them so much even to the point of an agonizing and, and tyrannizing death. That, brothers and sisters, is the image of the glorious passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why these days are full of the grace which they're filled with. And I say to you, and I say to you again as a reminder, a reminder to all of you that these days are days not just to come and to remember or to come because it's tradition, but it's a, to come and to live these days with your own heart and soul to live them as Jesus wanted to, us to live them to live them to the point where it becomes for us life changing not until the next year not until the next year but every single day of our life should be a change a renewal and a triumphant resurrection with Christ this is why today we celebrate the palms. We celebrate the palms today because we journey with Christ on this road to Jerusalem. Imagine what he was thinking on that donkey. Imagine as he was going into Jerusalem, knowing that all these people that are shouting praises to him are going to soon betray him. That probably would have been one of the loneliest moments of Jesus' life, knowing that at his most crucial time, all of these people, including his disciples, will run away. And we say, no, Jesus, we don't run away from you, but rather we run to you because you are our only refuge and hope. We run to you because we know that only through you there is salvation. And on the night of the resurrection, as I've said before many times, it is a night that will be experienced only once during the year. It is something which is absolutely unique. And I must say with joy that every single year I see that you are appreciating that night more and more. Every single year I see that you stay for the service afterwards and that makes me happy to see because it shows me that you too want to progress with Christ. You too want to grow. You too are understanding that the resurrection of Christ is more than, more than just a memory and especially more than just the soup that we're going to go and have when we go home. And you are beginning to understand this and it makes me happy. There is nothing sadder to see when we chant, Christ is risen, and we say, let Christ arise and let his enemies be scattered, and to see people scattering, leaving from the church at the moment where we're saying that his enemies be scattered. And I was laughing yesterday when I was listening to a talk from a bishop who was saying, that's probably the best moment 
he sees it in a very way. Best moment of Holy Week. All week he says, we have to deal with people, with thousands of people flogging to the church and they don't even know why. And all of them are complaining, all of them are whinging, all of them are doing whatever they want to do within the church. But that night, he said, those who stay, stay because they want to stay. They stay because they want to be there. And I pray, brothers and sisters, that you are one of those people. You are the people that are here because you want to be here. Because you want to understand something different, something more about our faith. And that our faith isn't just something which is on the surface, but it's something which comes deep within our heart and our love for Christ grows more and more. I wish you strength for this Holy Week, brothers and sisters. Forget about, try to stay as focused as you can and forget about the temptations and the trials that you'll see. The housework will always be there. Work will always be there. Other intrusions will always be there. You know you're going to come to church. You know there's going to be a lot of people. You know that old ladies will be pushing you. You know that people are going to be standing outside and talking about what they baked and where they're going after and whatever. All of that, brothers and sisters, you can ignore all of that if you want. You can put it aside and put as your focus the cross and Christ and Him crucified. It's up to you how you want your Basca to be and how you want to live it. Let's hope we live it as we have never lived it before, with joy, but especially with the salvific joy which Christ grants to us through his triumphant resurrection. I understand that a lot of you now will come and receive Holy Communion, and I ask you to come and receive with reverence, but also with patience. So now I'm going to read the prayer of forgiveness for all of you, so that we can be forgiven before Holy Week and before Holy Communion. So if you could please kneel so I can read the prayer of forgiveness. Παρακαλώ αν μπορείτε να γονατίσετε να διαβάσουμε την συγχωρετική ευθύνη.